So welcome to our program, uh, Conservation Easements 101. Uh, you probably noticed we are recording this. We will be posting it on our uh, prairiepartner.org website when we're done. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, our program today, we are going to tell you a little bit about who we are, why we do what we do, and hopefully give you a better understanding of what we do, specifically conservation easements. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat and we will do our best to answer them at the end. So I am Elisa Donovan and I'm the Vice President and General Counsel of the Coastal Prairie Conservancy. I've been with the Conservancy for seven years. Uh, before that, I was an attorney in private practice doing energy, real estate, business matters. Um, my husband and I have a some property in Colorado County where we run a small cow calf operation. And I've lived in Texas almost my entire life. Um, I have learned a lot about the importance of our native ecosystems, the coastal prairie, and I'm committed to doing my part to preserve it for wildlife and for people. And my name is Dan Fort. I'm a conservation associate here at the Coastal Prairie Conservancy. And I've been in Texas most of my life as well. I'm passionate about protecting the natural heritage of Texas and the biodiversity of our entire planet. My main duties include working with landowners to help conserve as many contiguous pieces of the land Texas landscape as possible and communicating with the NRCS, our habitat management partners at WHF, and all of our partners on the Texas Coastal Prairie Initiative and soon coming, the Grasslands and Savannahs Initiative. Uh, so the Coastal Prairie Conservancy was started in 1992 as the Katy Prairie Conservancy. Uh, we have been working to protect coastal prairie lands, including farms, ranches, and natural areas. And we're accredited, which means that we comply with the standards of the, text of the Land Trust Alliance. We currently protect over 31,000 acres in southeast Texas. About 18,000 of those acres are on the Katy Prairie, which is in Harris, Waller, and Fort Bend counties. And the additional 13,000 acres are located across our nine county region, which also includes Austin, Brazoria, Colorado, Jackson, Matagorda, and Wharton counties. Whoops, whoops, that ahead of, okay, there we go. So, you know, we care a lot about conservation as do a number of other organizations that are in our region. And so we all came together in the interest of conserving our coastal prairie landscape. And as you can see here, there's a long list of partner organizations that we have. Uh, I'm not gonna read them all, but we have a variety of educational institutions, government organizations, other land trusts operating in the region, as well as other non environmental nonprofits, whether they promote bird habitat or even hunting interests. And you know, we wanted them to more directly impact conservation in our region. And so we established the Texas Coastal Prairie Initiative with the purpose of sustaining the coastal prairie ecosystem. And this initiative provides funding to private landowners that want to protect their land or to implement habitat management practices that'll benefit the local coastal prairie wildlife. This was all funded through an award by the NRCS through its Regional Conservation Partnership Program. So I want to thank I want to take time to thank the NRCS and acknowledge that this program is supported by their funding. So without lands and habitat, we can't support some of our most iconic species. And so when we designed this Texas Coastal Prairie Initiative, we looked at some of the different species that use these lands. As you can see, we have grassland birds, waterfowl, and other animals that need wetlands. Others need riparian habitat, which means streamside or riverside habitat. And so our Coastal Prairie Initiative covers all of those ecosystem types. It doesn't have to be grassland. It doesn't have to be wetland. It could be a mix of some working lands and some natural areas as well. And so, as I said, we're working to preserve large areas between five and 25,000 acres because that's what we need to sustain the ecosystem. Connected areas are more impactful than fragmented areas that might only be 100 acres here or 100 acres there. And so we're trying to work strategically with landowners to ensure that we have bigger landscape level protected areas, and especially those areas that have natural native grasslands, wetlands, and special habitats that are relied on by the wildlife. Using conservation plans that identified areas needed to support the priority species, partners established priority areas for conservation. We're in the second year of the initiative and are pleased to report that we're successfully putting conservation on the ground. And as you can see here on the slides, those are our focus areas for this initiative. 
Yeah, so the Texas Coastal Prairie Initiative, it is a little bit broader than the Coastal Prairie Conservancy's focus area. And I just wanna point out this initiative, it, we are not the only land trust that might be working with landowners in this area. We use our partner organizations, some of which are represented on this call. Thank you for joining. I think I saw someone from uh, Native Prairie Association of Texas, and there may be a num number of other land trusts that are certainly partnering with us and participating in this initiative. Um, we actually have a second uh, initiative that we also are working on with some of the same partners and some additional partners. So I saw somebody from Bayou Land Conservancy is also joining on their co this call and they're a land trust that's also active um, on the Texas Grasslands and Savannas Initiative. So in, in this one, uh, we're still working on the agreement with NRCS, um, but it is a larger award and we do anticipate that funding will be available shortly. Uh, we're hoping as soon as this fall, we might be able to uh, open it up and start working with landowners to put some conservation on the ground with this expanded area. Uh, this initiative will prioritize grasslands that sequester carbon and also provide important grassland bird habitat. Um, you can see it's a slightly different area. It goes a little bit more inland to the post oak savanna region. Um, so both of these initiatives uh, lead to um, programs with landowners and some of outreach programs that we do. Um, and we're so happy that you're here with us. So before we get into it, uh, Daniel, can you, we're gonna try to do sort of a QA and a and um, answer all the questions we think you might have um, as we go through the program. So Daniel, how do we go about advancing land conservation? Great question. Well, we sometimes buy land fee title. So that means that we, the Coastal Prairie Conservancy, are the landowner and we manage and operate the land. Sometimes the donor may want to donate land that we either keep or with their agreement, we could swap for lands that are more strategically aligned with our work. Most of the land that we protect is through conservation easements. So we're here today to discuss what that means exactly. So, Alisa, now that, we've made, now that we've gained a better understanding of the Conservancy and some of our initiatives, when considering engaging with a landowner on a project, what are some of the values that might be protected by a conservation easement? Can any of the land be, can any land be subject to a conservation easement? I would say not any land, but a lot of land. So, um, conservation easements protect what we call conservation values. Um, in a nutshell, a conservation easement is an agreement where the land trust, like the Coastal Prairie Conservancy or one of our other land trust partners, agrees with the landowner that their private farm, ranch, or natural area will remain just that, a farm, ranch, or natural area. Conservation easements are a means to protect the land while keeping it in private ownership. The conservation easement is an agreement between the private landowner and the land trust to ensure that the conservation values of the land will be protected. Conservation values that we focus on, the Coastal Prairie Conservancy, they tend to be open space, natural habitats of fish, wildlife, or plants, and agricultural uses such as farms and ranches. Other land trusts um, might work on slightly different uh, values. Some protect historic and cultural assets. Um, so before we go on, what is a conservation value? Daniel, can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and what sort of land might be protected by an easement? Yes, so there are a number of conservation values that we uh, that we look into. And so here, so public benefit of, uh, of the property can relate to providing outdoor recreation, protecting our natural resources, such as air and water resources, uh, as well as wetlands, which could improve water quality and our upstream watershed health allows us to live in our cities. So moving forward with that, so we're seeing enjoyment, just being able to see undeveloped spaces is a conservation value that can be protect protected. So this photo shows that view from the top of Enchanted Rock in the Hill Country. I'm originally from the Hill Country myself. Uh, and easements are being used to help make sure people see trees and hills and not all rooftops on the coastal plains here those views might possibly be seen from a road or from a waterway so protection of land that's used as a farm or ranch is important for our public so we may have food security and the ability to feed our growing population conservation easements are a way to make sure that we'll have lands available for farming and ranching forever as you can see here this is a photo of black neck still 
which is a species of concern in Texas, conservation easements protect valuable habitat for our Texas wildlife. They also protect high quality examples of ecosystems and natural areas that are included in or contribute to the ecological viability of a local state or national park, preserve, refuge, or a similar conservation area. We may work on entering easements on lands that are next to Texas parks or national wildlife refuges to add buffers to those areas as opportunities arise. So what about public access? Do landowners need to let, to let others onto their land? Uh, absolutely not. So there are some land trusts that might work on easements for public access, but none of the conservation easements that the Coastal Prairie Conservancy holds um, require public access. Uh, so how do conservation easements work? Basically, it's a real estate transaction and the landowner is transferring a property right. I don't know if any of you have bought or sold any real estate, whether it's a house, a condo, or some open land, but there are a number of steps that have to happen for that to occur. First, we need a survey. We need to know exactly what area will be covered by the easement. Uh, we work with a title company, just as you might do when you buy or sell a house to verify ownership of that property. Uh, we would also review any encumbrances that might impact the property to make sure we understand uh, what could impact the uses of that land. We need to have an appraisal to make sure uh, we understand the value of that conservation easement, uh, particularly if there is a, a purchased easement and there are some funding sources involved. Uh, landowners that want to claim a tax deduction, we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, also would need an appraisal for their IRS uh, reporting purposes. Um, and then there's the deed. When you buy or sell a house, there's a deed. Um, in this case, the deed is the conservation easement. Basically, a conservation easement, it's a long written contract. It describes exactly what the owner is giving up and what protections are being put in place on that property. That contract would be recorded in the county records and it is enforceable in perpetuity. So during our initial visit to the property, we'll conduct a property assessment report to gain an initial understanding of the conservation values. However, once we decide to work with the landowner to pursue an easement, we'll then develop, we will then need to develop a baseline documentation report. For this report, through documentation, photos, and maps, we identify existing infrastructure on the property, both permanent and non-permanent, vegetative communities, as well as historic and current land uses. We also need to discuss the terms of the conservation easement to make sure we are both in agreement as to what is included. So those restrictions would include limits on construction. There's a limit on total impervious cover. We would not allow things like dumps or major commercial uses that damage conservation values. We generally protect the native trees and native grasslands, wetlands, and other features. Um, but we also understand the landowners continuing to usually live there and use that land and they might need to reserve some rights. Um, so reserved rights are those things that we agree the landowner may still do, such as reserve an area to build a new house, um, or if the landowner would like to divide the tract into two halves, for example, we would describe exactly what is allowed. And as well, a management plan is required by the conservation easement, and it's more specific about activities that the landowner might take to manage the property itself. And it, it is adaptive, so it can be modified by agreement between the landowner and the land trust. Oh, Alisa, can the lady pass along to heirs? Love it. Love the whooping crane and the little baby whooping crane. So small. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, it can be passed along to heirs. It can be sold. It can be transferred just like any um, piece of property. It is, however, still subject to that conservation easement. So the uses and what's agreed in the conservation easement would still apply to any future owners of the land. What if the landowner wanted to build another house? Well, let's talk. Like I said, you know, those are reserved rights um, that we can agree. When we write that conservation easement, we would be able to describe um, what homes already exist. And then if there are plans for future homes, like a guest house, for example, um, or another uh, building that the landowner would like to add, we would describe 
where that could be located and generally how big it might be. So those things can be agreed, but we do need to agree to it in advance or at the time we enter the easement. Well, as a landowner, are there some things that I would never be able to do? Yes, there are. <laughs> so this uh, shows a picture of a sand pit. This is something that happen is happening adjacent to some Katy Prairie Preserve lands and it's not protected by an easement. So um, major excavation is never allowed under a conservation easement. Um, this other uh, image, that's a subdivision plat, another example of some property that was planned to be um, developed immediately next to the Katy Prairie uh, Preserve. Good news is this landowner has agreed to work with us to enter a conservation easement. Um, and now that land, instead of being a number of uh, smaller home sites, it will be protected permanently as grassland and it's particularly great uh, grassland bird habitat. It will stay as one tract forever. Um, the agreement may also have other restrictions depending on the conservation values that are being protected. Uh, but basically the goal is to ensure that that land remains a farm, ranch, or natural area forever. So does an easement change how exactly I can use the land? So for the most part, uh, uses that are typical of a Texas ranch can continue. So this would include hunting, agriculture, um, also, a landowner may want to divide the property into two or three subdivisions. So, um, for example, they might want to divide the property into two tracks if they have um, a home site on one, but they might want to reserve another home site for a future heir or um, other owner. Um, and they could also sell a portion of it to a third party. We do need to agree to those terms up front as they do affect the value of the conservation easement. And then we're all the landowners are always permitted again to transfer it to heirs or to sell it. So afterwards, what happens, Daniel? Is is it just one and done, or you know what's what's going on with the land trust and the landowner after this, after this is all done? Great question. So as you mentioned, um, we is making sure that the land stays under use is consistent with the conservation easement. So. This is a long-term relationship between between the landowner and the entity. Um, and we're gonna have to get out to conduct annual monitoring every year. So that would mean a member of our conservation team or members of our conservation team coming out to get to document the values on the property and just to make sure that everything is staying in line with the easement. So, Alisa, what happens if someone wants to build a road or a pipeline through my land? Uh, could land protected by a conservation easement be condemned? Uh, yes, unfortunately, there is no protection from condemnation uh, for a conservation easement land. However, it might be more difficult if that easement was funded with federal or state funds. Um, if uh, if there is a condemnation, then those proceeds are shared between the conservation easement holder and the landowner according to the proportionate values. So when we enter an easement, we both have a continued interest in the property. So we would actually both be parties to that condemnation um, proceeding. Well, this is all great. Thank you so much. And that's, that's, that's a great answer. But how much exactly does it cost to do this? Yeah, everyone wants to know this. So it it it's a it's a um involved transaction. There are multiple steps, and each one of them does have some costs. Um, this could include costs for the appraisal, uh, legal fees. We do recommend that landowners work with attorneys to advise them on um the terms of the agreement. Uh, there's a survey that's required, title insurance, um, an environmental report, uh, mineral review, which um might depend on the funding source on what exactly is needed for that. Uh, there's the development of the management plan, which sometimes has a cost. Sometimes we're able to find a party that can do that basically at no cost to the landowner. And then there's the stewardship contribution. Actually, a large portion of the cost in entering an easement relates to the stewardship contribution, which is basically the funds 
um, that we request so that we could deposit them in our stewardship account. And we use those earnings to make sure um, we can support our ongoing commitment to monitor and enforce the terms of the easement in perpetuity. Um, so when you add these all up, uh, the total cost might be somewhere between $50,000 and up to $100,000 for an easement project. It really depends on the size of um, the project and the complexity. You might think this is a major expense and you wouldn't be wrong. Um, so you might be asking, are there funding opportunities? And, you know, can I really afford to do this? So Daniel, are there funding opportunities? Yes, there's a big yes. There are funding opportunities available. There are state funds, mostly through Texas Parks and Wildlife. There are federal awards. Um, there are also donations from private individuals that support our mission and our particular projects. And then sometimes we also have private foundations that might be able to step in and help provide funds as needed. So there are some funding sources that we have worked with. And, you know, we don't need you guys to worry about it too much. You know, we're really crafty with working with landowners, you know, if there's a great conservation project, we're going to explore all the funding options and come up with suggestions. On these are just some of the specific funding sources that we worked with in the past. So the agricultural land easement program within RCS, that's a nationwide program, but our state gets a pool of funds that are used to go towards working lands, farms, and ranches, and it pays for 50% of easement value or up to 75% for certain grasslands. And then you also have the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. This is a fun, this is funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they really love lands on the coastal prairie, especially when they have wetlands and waterfowl habitat. So we can apply for and receive funds that can be used to buy easements through this act. And there's also the Texas Parks and Wildlife Farm and Ranch Lands Conservation Program, and this is targeted to protect working lands and also provide benefit for wildlife and for water resources. Uh, we introduced a little bit the Texas Coastal Prairie Initiative and the Texas Grasslands and Savannas Initiative. Those are both funded by NRCS, and they do provide funding for conservation easements. Um, under these programs, a landowner may be paid half of the value of the easement, and the other half must be donated, or we might be able to find some private uh, funding so source to help support uh, a purchase. Um, funding is limited and projects are selected based on how well they meet the criteria for um, these programs. Um, I will note that unlike other NRCS programs, all landowners are eligible regardless of income. So this no AGI, which is the adjusted gross income, um, does not apply to these two initiatives. Um, for almost all of our projects, available funding only covers a portion of the cost. It might cover some of the transaction costs such as the appraisal or stewardship contribution. Sometimes we can pay a portion of the value of the easement. Um, funding for money for funding of conservation easements in Texas, it's limited and it is competitive. So usually a donation for part of the value is needed um, and only funding is available for those sort of most strategic projects. Um, other projects wouldn't happen unless the landowner was in a position to donate that conservation easements. Um, the good news is donated conservation easements also provide a significant financial benefit to um, landowners. And um, so donations that are made in the form of a conservation easement donation can be used to offset income so that landowner ends up paying lower federal income taxes. Uh, most landowners can deduct an amount up to half of their adjusted gross income in one year, more or less cutting their half their taxes in half for that year. Um, and then if that landowner is a qualified farmer or rancher, um, that is a person who makes most of their income from agricultural operations based on their tax return, um, they can deduct all of their gross uh, adjusted gross income in one year, basically eliminating their income tax for that year. And um, since the value of the deduction could be significant um, and it may not be used in one year, it can actually be carried forward for 15 more years. So it's a really um, generous tax um, benefit. And uh, we're fortunate this conservation easement um, and funding has been a bipartisan um, uh, uh, policy that has been supported um, by both sides of Congress. So we're really happy that um, this exists and we'll, hopefully continue to be funded in that way. 
So I do want to take just a minute to show an example of how this might work. Um, so for this example, uh, we have a Texas ranch. It's valued at $2 million when it's not encumbered, no restrictions. That means there's no easement. Anyone might buy it for any use. They could buy it for housing subdivision, a mining site, a solar farm. Um, well, after the easement is entered, um, those uses are no longer permitted. The value would be reduced. Now it can only be used for a farm, ranch, uh, natural area. Um, in my example, the value has been lowered to 1.2 million, which is a discount of um, 40% or a difference of $800,000. Um, that difference, that's the value of the conservation easement. The easement value is higher if the land is more likely to be developed, such as on the edge of the city limits, and it would be lower if it's in a more rural area with less development pressure. It also might be lower if the land is in a floodplain or there's other reasons it's less likely to be developed. Again, that easement value is determined by an independent appraisal. Uh, in my experience, the value of a conservation easement might vary from 25% if there's not a lot of development pressure. Um, it could be up to 80% if it's next to new subdivisions sort of on the urban edge. Um, so that $800,000, that's the non-cash charitable contribution to a nonprofit organization. How's that for a mouthful? Um, but that can result in a significant deduction on your federal income taxes for the year of the donation. And again, it could be carried forward for 15 years if that landowner isn't able to use that full $800,000 in one year, they might be able to use 200,000 for four years, for example. Um, so Daniel, are there other benefits to the landowners? Yes, so we've talked a lot about funding and donation value, which provide direct financial benefits to the landowner, but there are other benefits from entering into easement. When working with a land trust, you'll find that you'll learn a lot about your property, things that you never knew. Many landowners that we work with are thrilled when they get a report that shows what's special about the plant communities or some of the wildlife that might use their property. They become more educated than they were before. As most landowners uh, we work with, they're interested in conservation, whether it's for wildlife or for other reasons. And going through this process is eye-opening and landowners really, really appreciate this. And landowners also get benefit from the development of a management plan and possibly access to funding sources that can help to implement the plan. For instance, we might help identify issues with invasive species and might be able to help the landowner access resources to treat them. So, and if you're able to convince your neighbors, we could do landscape protection where we have different easements that are next to each other and you're assured that we can protect the large landscape. And as we said, we're searching for those five to 25,000 contiguous acres. So, but really going through the process clarifies your wishes for the land. Often the people that we work with don't wanna see their land broken up or sold and they care deeply about the wildlife that uses that land. And they're comforted to know that it's going to be there in the future, whether it's for the owls and nests in the trees or for the deer they grow in the back pasture. There's a real attachment that landowners have to these spaces that they take care of, especially when it's been in their land for more than a generation. It's a way to preserve that legacy and to know that the land will exist as a farm, ranch, or natural area, even after you're gone. Okay, that was a lot. We're going to take a breath and see if there are any questions um, in the chat. And if, if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and put them in the chat now. Hang on, I don't know if you can access that. I'm looking for it. Yes. Well, I'll be able to uh, read out any questions that you have. I think we could also potentially unzoom, uh, unmute if people raise their hands. So I think we'd start with everyone muted, but. I believe everyone should have the ability to unmute themselves. Here we have here we have a question here. Are there size constraints on conservation easements? Uh, this is a good question, and that would be land trust uh, specific. Uh, some land trusts you know, may may do an easement on a very small parcel and others might require something larger. For the Coastal Prairie Conservancy, our rule of thumb is we look for about 100 acres as a minimum, um, with the exception if it's next to an otherwise protected land, we might do something a little smaller. 
Um, we do prefer larger um, easements, but uh, we would certainly entertain that. Some funding sources, um, you know, it just might not be, if it's a smaller tract, it may not be um, quite as, uh, it wouldn't score as well for that funding sources. There are all these sort of points when you apply for a federal grant under Fish and Wildlife Services or either even under our um, NRCS grant. So larger properties might be more likely to receive funding than a smaller property. We have another question here about can the terms of the conservation easement change? They have a friend that is required to get rid of ash junipers as a part of their as a part of their easement. And now that we know, now that they know more about the value of ash junipers, they're curious if they can get rid of that requirement within the easement. So if there is a restriction in the easement, um that cannot be amended because the landowner has either been paid for that or they've received a significant tax deduction. So that was a restriction for whatever reason they agreed to it. And I would say generally you can't change it. Uh, if it's if the restrictions in the management plan, and I would be surprised to be this specific about a specific vegetation in the easement, I would hope that would be dealt with in the management plan. Then you can amend that. You might make some um, changes as to how you might um, manage that species. Uh, it's really not part of the annual assessment. Like um, if, if the agreement that the annual monitoring visit is supposed to just say, I've seen your property, you have not, there's no violations of the uh, conservation easement. Sometimes the steward will make recommendations if they see an invasive species or something, they might say, hey, you might want get to rid, get rid of that. But there's really not an obligation to manage the property. It's really just a helpful suggestion on the part of the steward. Daniel, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, ma'am. I believe that that was that was a pretty good explanation. Uh, okay. I have three questions, if I can. Sure. On the steward stewardship con uh, contribution, does that come from the uh, property owner or from the agency accepting the donation? Uh, so usually from the property owner or from an outside funding source. I mean, I wish I had a huge bank account just sitting here waiting to, to, to do all of these projects. But when we accept a new easement, it comes with new responsibility to make sure we're gonna have staff to go out there and monitor that in perpetuity. We have to get um, some insurance uh, as a land trust when we when we uh, enter new conservation easements, we, we buy this insurance to make sure if there's an issue, we were able to enforce the terms. So those are actual direct costs to the land trust. And so the stewardship contribution, we, um, and this is part of our accreditation requirements with the Land Trust Alliance. They, they require that we have enough resources to make sure we can live up to those terms in perpetuity. And so we need to get those funds from somewhere, whether it's the Land Trust or we can potentially seek some other grant funding to help um, make that contribution. And then the second question is, is that the case even if the property is donated, if the easement is 100% donated? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. When we have a landowner that's willing to do a 100% donation, um, you know, we'd love if they could pay all of the out-of-pocket costs and make that stewardship donation. And some of them are in a financial position to do that. And they're, you know, we're a charity and they're happy to make that donation. But we also understand that could be a financial hardship and some landowners might be able to make the donation, but they just don't have the cash to, to pay for these other costs. And in those cases, we would need to go out and seek funding. And we are, you know, generally, we've been pretty successful doing that. I can't speak for all of the land trust, but, you know, we we kind of know who's interested in what sort of habitat. And it depends on the project and how we might work with the landowner. But we wouldn't want a landowner that wants to donate an easement to not talk with us because they are concerned about those out-of-pocket costs. If it is a good project, we can... Um, work together and try to find a way to make it happen. And then my last question is about the tax donation. There's a 15 year carry for it. Do you <laughs> have to use it on the first year or can't, is it up to you based on high, you know, some years your taxes are much higher than other years. 
if you're exactly. retired, for example. Yeah, exactly. So the way I understand it, and you need to talk to your own financial and tax advisors. I, I'm not supposed to be giving anyone advice because I'm not your attorney or advisor, but um, it can be used like that deduction is available. So in this ex in the example I had of eight hundred thousand dollars, maybe you only have income of fifty thousand dollars, and you can only deduct against twenty five thousand. Well, that's going to take a long time to use that eight hundred thousand. But maybe in year three or four, you have for whatever reason you sell a bunch of stock, or you have some big income, or maybe you sell some property. Then what's left of that deduction can be used in year three or four. So you have the year of their donation plus fifteen additional years, and you can use that. Any during any one of those years until it is all used up. I don't know if you can like decide you don't want to use it one year and then use it the next, even though you could because of some tax bracket. I mean, that's probably getting into a little more advanced tax planning than I'm, you know, authorized to to give you. Great. Uh, and we've got a couple more questions here in the comments. Um, what are the consequences if a violation of the easement is discovered during an annual monitoring visit? So it's a contract and it's an enforceable contract. Um, and so if, if there is a breach of that um, agreement, then we would have the right to have legal recourse. We could, you know, hopefully we can, there's some dispute resolution provisions where we have to give a notice and the landowner has a chance to respond and to remedy the situation. Um, and we've never had to take anyone to court. Uh, we've had a couple instances where there was sort of an inadvertent violation where something happened they just didn't realize or, um, you know, they certainly didn't intend to violate the easement and then they fixed it as soon as they realized there was an issue. But if there's a violation and the landowner is not able to remedy the situation or um, say somebody buys the land and they just decide to sort of breach the agreement and build a residential subdivision, we have the right to take them to court and to seek enforcement of that agreement. Um, I mentioned we have insurance. Uh, it's basically conservation easement defense insurance. So if we need to bring suit, uh, we would be able to access the resources so that we could, you know, see that through. And here's another question uh, about how many acres are under conservation easement in Texas and what percentage of the total land would that be? Hmm. I've seen that figure, but I don't know that I have that off the top of my head. I might have to. I could say yeah. a great resource would be the Texas Land Trust Council. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of information related to uh, everything that's happening in the state of Texas, as well as all of the land trusts that are operating in their different regions, as well as what their focuses are and things. And they'd be able to give you that, that number. Yeah, the total sort of of all of Texas lands that are um, conserved, it's only about 94, 95%, um, but that includes the federal wildlife refuges, the Texas um, state parks, county parks, and conservation easements. So that number includes all of those. Um, mostly Texas is privately owned. And to clarify that 94 or 95 percent she was mentioning what is the private lands yes yes clearly and another question here is a land trust different from a conservancy do you know how many acres in oh that's another do you know how many acres in total protected texas yeah so is a land trust different from a conservancy uh i was sort of using those interchangeably so we're the coastal prairie conservancy so sometimes we refer to ourselves as the conservancy the Nature Conservancy is a land trust. We're a land trust. There's other, um, you know, land trusts active in the area. Uh, so I, I think we're just using those terms interchangeably. Yep. And I agree with Daniel that Texas Land Trust Council website has a listing of all of the different land trusts that are in Texas and what regions they might be um, active in. Uh, certain land trusts are geographic focused, so they might only be limited to, you know, the hill country or, you know, some other area. Uh, like I said, we're limited to a sort of nine county regional area around the coastal prairie um, outside of Houston down towards Matagorda, Jackson counties. Um, and then there's other land trusts that are um, 
statewide or even international. So. Unless anyone else has any more questions that they'd like to put in the chat or unmute. Yeah, you want to tell them about the survey, Daniel? We don't want to forget that. Yes. Before they leave. Definitely. Um, and as well, there on the last slide, there is a little bit more information. So, you know, I do encourage everyone to visit ColesBerryConservancy.org uh, to learn more about the Coles Prairie Conservancy and to also visit PrairiePartner.org just to learn a little bit more about the Texas Coastal Prairie Initiative and our Texas Crescent and Savannah's Initiative that's coming out. And you can also register for our upcoming conference, which will be which will be Thursday, October the 24th and Friday, October 25th at the George Ranch in Fort Bend County. We're really excited for that. And if, if you'd like free technical assistance, we can connect you to advisors that can come up with a plan for your land. There's no obligation and the planning is free through the Texas Coast Parade Initiative. And we'd love to stay in touch um, as well. You'll be receiving a link to a, conf to a confidential survey. If you could please take the time to complete it, that'd be very helpful for our reporting requirements with the NRCS. And we'd like your feedback for future programs. So but with that, you know, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And if you have any questions, please do not he hesitate to reach out directly. As you can see, our emails are here on the slides. And they're also there at coastalprairieconservancy.org on our website. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.